Gracious Heavenly Father, I just ask that You would seal to our hearts only that which is truth. We know that we're limited when we come to study Your Word, that there is so much that we don't comprehend. Allow us, dear Lord, by Your grace to fellowship in love and filter out all of that which is foolish, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, we are studying together in the book of Revelation verse by verse, and we've come to look at the church at Laodicea. Now, keep in mind the letter to all of the churches from, from Ephesus to Laodicea contained messages for all the churches. And as I, uh, as I pointed out, we need to admit that the angel in each of these churches and, and throughout these letters is singular. So he's speaking to the angel of the church. That's how these letters begin. And they conclude with a message to those who have an ear to hear, and that is his people in the church. That's At least that's the position that I'm taking here. They're exhorted to listen to what he says to the churches. And since these letters are prophetic, I suggested that what we're looking at is the condition of the church of Jesus Christ just before He returns to rapture those who were His. So we begin then with the letter to the church at Laodicea and to, and to the messenger, the angel, the pastor, uh, uh, deacon, uh, whatever you want to put there, but it's singular. Uh, can't be a heavenly angel. Uh, since they don't do anything wrong, they don't fit the context of the of the criticism or the exhortation. These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness. The beginning of the creation of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, amen. The Word is truth. We know this book is true. We know that our God is true. These things saith the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He, he's a faith, Christ is a faithful witness. Now, that we, sh we shouldn't uh, find that difficult to comprehend, but in comparison to Him, well, the question is, is are we? You know, what He says can be counted on. Not so in our case. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is not somebody who minced words. When He says something, He means it. And His Word is faithful. He can be trusted. And it will not change. I, the Lord thy God, change not. He's a true witness of God. The Lord Jesus Christ is the witness. We need, we need to establish our position. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk more on that, on that wor one word, position position because this video is going to touch on the, the important matter of position and I'll explain that more as I go along uh, do I present my work my abilities my strength my my brainless know-how and everything else to God or do I plead the finished work of Christ when I stand before God in judgment that's not condemnation but that's my, my life's work being judged. It's not me, but it's Christ who, who will stand there in my place. He's my witness, my mediator, the beginning uh, of uh, the creation of God. And there's an expression in the authorized version that a Jehovah Witness just jumps up and down about, and Mormons, uh, and so forth. They just really rejoice over that verse. Doesn't that text say that He's the first thing God created and immediately you've diminished Jesus Christ? I'm persuaded that many Christians, in fact, in their own concepts of biblical doctrine, biblical truth, have diminished the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, He's some kind of offspring of God. He's really not exactly God. He's He's just a little bit less than God. In fact, they'll quote this verse. Uh, he's the first thing that God ever created. Well, that is not what the verse says. 
the verse says he's the originator of the creation. You know it in Colossians 1, by him were all things created that are in heaven and in earth. All things were created by him and for him. That is not saying that he's the first thing God created. That is saying that he is the one who created. He is the one that offered the creation of God. Now your Bible is going to say, I would thou wert cold or hot. And you could take that as, you know, I will that you were cold or hot. But keep in mind, when God wills something, it's done. He does his will. That is not what the Word says. The best translation I can come up with is it'd be a lot better if you were cold or hot. But He isn't willing that they be cold or hot. That is, He has not made a decision that they be cold or hot. And I remind you that He holds these seven stars in His right hand. God is, can do with this messenger what He wants. God is supremely sovereign, not man. He works in us both the will and do of His good pleasure. And that includes this messenger. And this originator of God's creation included His death in our place that we might stand before God without spot and without blemish. Christ who created all things was made sin for us, dying on the cross, being made sin for us. He who knew no sin being made sin for us. That is incomprehensible to me. But that's what He did. So when we see that expression, the beginning of the creation of God, bear in mind it, it includes not only the stars and the earth, but His death on the cross and our redemption. And His love, mercy, grace, and, and control and, and direction in our lives. I know thy, thy works, and, and thy is singular, or thou, thy, it's singular. And we wind up with a, a plural again at the end of the letter. Let, let him hear what the Spirit says to all the churches. Now, I'm somewhat of a stickler here for the grammar, I'll admit, you know, but it, I have no problem saying that this church at Laodicea, that this is the way it appears, though the letter is written to the messenger. And to me, that makes perfect sense because the assembly is, is going to reflect only reflect the message that the church stands for. We're told, let not many of you become teachers, for in doing so you shall incur a stricter judgment. Does that mean, you know, is that some kind of condemnation or something? No, it isn't. It's criticism, which we actually see right here in these seven letters. these works. You're neither cold nor hot, and it, and it would appear as though that word is, is, uh, is salima or uh, bulamai, uh, or one of the words for making a decision, and it isn't. It might be translated, it would be a better thing if you were cold or hot, but because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Very strong language. It scared a lot of Christians. I'm sure, down through the centuries. What does it mean to be cold? And what does it mean to be hot? And why does he say that it would be better if you were cold or hot? I'm going to suggest that that should be obvious to all of us. If you're cold, you usually know you're cold. And if you're hot, you usually know you're hot. At least you know the condition that you're in. And when you're lukewarm, well, you don't know the condition that you're in. I mean, you know, it just it, it's just sort of a self-satisfied condition. And you don't realize how bad off or, or good, good off that you really are. So it would be better that you were in a situation where you knew a little bit about yourself, about how good you were or how bad you were, but, but you don't even really know what your position actually is. You don't even know who you really are in Christ. That's how I'm reading this, folks. Everybody who writes or teaches on this knows Christians who are very cold. You know, once in a while, you know, they go to church. They, they, they never go to 
prayer meeting. They don't do much in the church, and it's and it's just a casual sort of experience with them. Maybe they get together, you know, because their friends are there or whatever. Those are the cold Christians. And then we all know those, you know, Christians who are they're so on fire they want to redeem the whole world, and, and so they they use all of those illustrations, and so they say. You know, these are new creations in Christ that are really cold and they don't do very much. And, and along comes lordship salvation. You know, which says, no, you, you don't want to be that. You know, if you're really a new creation in Christ Jesus, it's going to show through. And, and I want to be fair with these people. I mean, it isn't that you have to do good works and you have to show forth your faith in Christ in order to be redeemed. They would never say that. What they say is, if, if you really are redeemed, that will show forth. And if it doesn't show forth, you're not redeemed. And folks, you can't do that with the equation. I mean, you can't transpose things across the equal sign to say that if one is, is really redeemed, he does good works. It, it, it is the same as saying he must do good works to be, to be redeemed. I, it, you're, saying, you're basically saying the same thing. There is no way that you can change the equation. We can't say Christians are hot and non-Christians are cold. We can't do that. If that was true, then what in the world, well, what in the world do we do with the lukewarm? Which is probably where most Christians today are at, at least in my opinion. Same with saying hot or are the good Christians. Well, you know, if the hot's the good Christians and cold are the bad, they're the bad Christians. Uh, and if that were true, well, who are the lukewarm? And Christians go to great lengths to point out that there, there are, yeah, there, Steve, but there's carnal Christians and there's spiritual Christians. And, and you know, uh, that is not what that text says. What that text says is there are spiritual Christians who act carnal once in a while. I don't believe that Jesus Christ did an incomplete work. And of course, that's the fundamental thesis of those who are, are proponents of lordship salvation. Since he didn't do an incomplete, uh, since he didn't do a, uh, an incomplete work, then well, uh, you know, I don't know. I've, it's been so long since I've talked to these people, but if. Uh, you know, every Christian is going to show forth some, somehow that new life in Christ. You know, if, if, uh, if they're a Christian, well, they're going to show it. I mean, that's, and folks, I don't believe that for a second. And I can, I can, I can hear many of you clicking off the video right now. There was a guy, it was a, a gentleman who for most of his life, he hardly ever left his, his apartment. Once in a while, he'd go out and get something to eat and come back. He never spoke to anybody about the Lord. Never preached a sermon to anybody. He lived a hermit's life. There wasn't any evidence at all that he knew Christ. Nobody could bear any testimony to the fact that he, re that he really ever spoke to him about the Lord. Maybe he did, but there's no evidence of that. And he died in that little apartment, leaving a thing that we call Strong's Concordance. For which I praise the Lord for. So, what he's going to vomit out is singular. It isn't the individual people who are redeemed but don't show it. It's this church and its message. Christ didn't want anything to do with this message. So I don't want you to use that text, whatever you do with, with cold or hot, to say that God is going to vomit out some Christians because that is not what the text says. He's talking singular about this church. If you're going to make it an individual, then it's got to be the messenger. I happen to think that this is the message that the church holds forth. And this particular church, this particular church, the church at Laodicea, holds forth a message that God says is one that doesn't... You don't know where you're at. And if that doesn't describe the church folks in these final days, I, I don't know what does. It doesn't understand its position in Christ. And what, about, what do I mean by that? Well, Paul had a lot to say about that. 
What is the testimony this church holds forth in regard to Jesus Christ being the true witness? You know, we can argue that, well, that lukewarm means, uh, well, so he, he don't really believe in the deity of Christ or, or, you know, he's not sold on the inspiration, infallibility, and inerrancy of the scriptures. You know, he, he believes that redemption is based on human works, not the finished work of Christ. And we can, we can make an awful long list, okay? Or we can see those as the symptoms, all of the, that that we could put on a list, we could see that as the symptoms of a much more serious disease, of a, of a single root cause. Lukewarm seems to say to me that things aren't important. And the reason why they're not important is because of an, of an identity crisis of sorts. And you've got to understand who we are in Christ to, to care about that. If you, if you are a messenger, a pastor in a church, and you understand the finished work of Christ, and that is your message, and that is what you're preaching, and someone comes in and wants to preach something else, you're going to care about that. I don't think they much cared about that at Laodicea. I think the text makes it clear they didn't much care about that at all. But just, just, just to make myself clear here, the text is not saying that if you're not a gung-ho Christian, that you're going to be vomited out of the Lord's mouth. The text is saying whoever this angel of the church of Laodicea is, is not teaching the truth concerning who we are in Christ. And the very letter bears that out. If, you, if we slow down and look at the words the Lord says. And that's what the church stands for. And in that church are those who are His. That's, the, that's that way in every church. A hot or cold drink is refreshing, depending on the, well, depending on the situation, of course, I suppose. But, uh, but lukewarm isn't. It's, lukewarm is never refreshing. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. You believe all is well when it's not. You lack understanding concerning who you are and what you've been given in Christ. You suffer from an identity crisis. Every word of that verse describes the condition of those who fail to understand who they are in Christ, their position in Christ, which can only be known through the testimony of the faithful and true Word of God, which Jesus calls Himself. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness does not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see and dearly beloved, the text is saying that the angel of that church considered himself to be rich and to be clothed. He didn't think he needed anything. There's only one way that I, I believe that we can read that. He is obviously, totally, completely unaware of what he does need. And when we look at what he needs... That is also obvious from our Lord's words, that thou mayest be rich. Well, we are. And white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. Well, we have been. Are you, are you getting this? That thou mayest be rich and clothed. And we are. We're wealthy in Christ. Okay? We've been clothed with the righteousness of God in Christ. That the, that the shame of thy nakedness does not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see... See what? Just what I believe I've been saying. To see who they are. To see God in His Word. To fellowship with Him. To feast upon that Word, which by which we are sanctified, the word of truth, that thou mayest see, absolutely poor and miserable and naked in the sight of God, and you, are, you and I know that we can't bring to God anything 
of ourselves at all. I've preached this in probably, I don't know how many thousands of, of sermons. Not a one of us is redeemed because we deserve to be redeemed. You're not any better than the lowest, filthiest sinner that ever lived who's headed for hell. And God doesn't call you a sinner. He calls you a saint. You have no, you and I have no merit that we can claim before God. Our citizenship in this country or any other country has no bearing. You, you brought nothing that was worthwhile to Christ. You are a new creation in Christ because He loved you and because He died in your place. No merit. You didn't bring anything that made you worthy to do that. The only reason that God loves you, folks, is because you're His, not because of the way you look or the way you live or the way that you act or what you do or, or how you perform or anything else. Only because you are His. Steve, you mean you, you believe that once saved, always saved junk? Yeah, I do. I'm stuck with Him. I, I mentioned this. I know I've mentioned this in the past. You know, my dad was a pretty hard dis disciplinarian. You know, and of course, I was never naughty. So, you know, most of my life, I was punished unfairly, you know, and I was going to get back at him. So I said to my dad, I said, I wish I'd been born in the neighbor's family. You know, I thought that that would crush him, you know, and he'd treat me a, a lot nicer from then on. And he said, well, tough luck, you weren't. You're my kid. And folks, that's where you are. You belong to Christ. You're God's child. You're not God's child because you wanted to be. You're not God's child because you looked at your, your life and said, oh man, my life is a mess and I got to turn it around and I got to do something. I'll accept Christ. You know, that may have been your experience, folks, okay? But that's not the reason you're His. You're His because He chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world. Why is that not your message? And He died in your place. Now He says, I counsel you, I advise you to buy of Me gold tried in the fire. See there, Steve, it says buy. It says buy. Yeah, that's true. It does say buy. I believe the word buy must be referring to His Word. You do that. You buy it. You do that because Jesus Christ died in your place. You buy that through the, an understanding of His Word. That's the only offering that you can give. It's the only price, folks, that we can pay. How do you how do you become how do you become clothed so that your nakedness does not appear? By the righteousness of Jesus Christ. How do you know that? By his word. Anoint your eyes with eye salve. That's the Holy Spirit. John 17, 17. Sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. Folks, we cannot know truth separate from this book. I'm talking about real truth, spiritual truth, an understanding of who you are in Christ, why you're here, where, where you are, knowing what your purpose is, how you stand before God. That can't be known through experiences or anything else. That can't be known separate from the Word of God. My Word alone will adjust your condition. Okay, he says. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. God doesn't love everybody. Sorry to destroy that sacred cow of yours, but He doesn't love everybody. The verse Settles that argument right there. As many as I love. As many as I love. And we don't like that. That just, you know, there's got to be something good in me that, that, you know, for God to love me. And uh, I hate backtracking. You know, I, this, this video will be long enough as it is, but He doesn't love you because of anything in you. He loves you because... He, you're His. He died in your place. Okay? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore. Zealous. Okay? 
We, we tend to kind of breeze over that word zealous. I think that that's a marvelous word there. Zealous and repent. Okay? You can get in some of the most violent arguments you'll ever know scripturally when you point out the fact that God don't love everybody. You know, even though despite the fact that, that Satan has a family, that he sowed seed, and clearly the scriptures declare uh, that they're Satan's children, that, that the terror of the sons of the devil. You know, I, I didn't say that. God did. It's what my Lord said. The weed are the sons of the kingdom. The tear are the sons of the devil. They which are after the flesh. And if you want to draw some dispensational distinction and say, well, Stevie's talking to Israel, not the church. The, the same principle applies. Satan sowed his seed. Christ sowed his seed. And we belong to Christ. So he doesn't love everybody. I invite you to view my video on John 3.16 if you can find it. It's, it's here on this channel. But everybody that He loves, He rebukes and chastens. If, if He loves you, you're His. And if you're His, He rebukes and chastens you personally because you're His child. Okay, He chastens every son whom He receives. Don't be misled to think that, he, well, I'm to be chastened because of my sin. Or I'm, I'm being scourged and I'm being disciplined because I, like, like my father took me to the woodshed. So, you know, I messed up. I did wrong. And now he's whooping me. Folks, that is not biblical. The text clearly says that we are chastened because, because we are sons. And he chastens every son whom he receives. Every one. You're being raised by your heavenly parent. It has nothing to do with sin. That issue has been forever settled. Therefore, be zealous and change your mind. Again, it's singular. The testimony of this messenger or the message of this church is a false testimony. The messenger needs to change his mind. That false testimony being one that doesn't reflect the reality of just who they are. As many as I love, and I'm just thrilled with that those words. As many as I love. I don't know how you feel about that. It's addressed to this church at Laodicea. In Laodicea, there are those whom He loves, and He's chastening and rebuking, and He's asking them, therefore, change your mind. Okay? All right. And... Uh, there is marvelous grace in this in this amazing last letter, you know, to the church at Laodicea, if you bother to look for it. And now we come to that old that famous verse that everybody knows, you know, and now we come to you know to the twentieth verse. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in to him and we'll sup with him and he with me. Everybody knows the verse. The common interpretation of this verse is that the Lord Jesus Christ is standing outside your heart pleading, but there's no handle on the door and you got to open it. And if you don't open it, it won't be open. But if you do open it, well, then he'll come in and he'll redeem you. He'll die in your place. And, and, and instead of going to hell, you'll go to heaven. I believe that's basically the classic approach to that verse. And I don't think that's what that verse says. You know, because you didn't open the door and let him in to redeem you. That's basically the Arminian position today. It's the position of almost all modern evangelism. But I believe that that brings Christ down. There's, there's poor old God, and he can't get you unless you do something. Why, folks, is there such a desperate effort to make man sovereign over God? You chose your wife, or, or you chose your husband, uh, but you didn't choose your parents, okay? And you didn't choose your kids, okay? You might have chose to have kids, but you didn't choose who they were going to be. And folks, there, is, there are deep, profound spiritual lessons in that. I think that's rather important. Christ is the one that began the creation of God. He's spoken into existence. He's God, and you cannot change the truth that His sheep hear His voice. Okay? How many? 
some of them, all of them. So should we read that? Has every one of his sheep are going to open that door and be redeemed? Well, I suppose you could read it that way. That's not how I look at that. Or, or is feasting together with him an illustration of fellowship over his word? Word that that fellowship is centered around him and not ourselves. I think, folks, I think you have the privilege and the opportunity of intimate and close fellowship with Jesus Christ to hear his voice through this book. The word used in the Greek language for the meal, you know, that, that you would have if you invited an honored guest. So one possible approach to this verse is that God's children have the tremendous privilege of intimate fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ, feasting on His Word together, and that seems to best fit the context, especially, especially in light of the Lord's criticism of this messenger. Okay? And I hope I explained that. Well, um, it's. I think sometimes if we study hard through these sections of of God's word, it we get a picture. It it, it almost becomes alive, and we get a picture, and we're we clearly. We, it's almost as if we're there, and we can see really what's going on. But I just I just ask you folks to slow down, and look at each word carefully even if it's just a personal pronoun or a conjunction, okay? To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father on His throne. Look at the amazing grace here, folks. The church, listen, the church that is in the worst condition of the seven, clearly, Christ is, is showing that He desires their fellowship together in the Word, and he, and he concludes by reminding them that they are His. They are overcomers, okay? And they will, because He died in their place, sit with Him in His throne. Not on His throne. The original text says in. And uh, that, can, that can be a little, little confusing, I suppose. But, but that's what, it's Epsilon Nu. In, in the Greek. It's not epi, upon, it's, it's in. Okay, I'm just, i it's, my, I'm got to point that out. Okay. The one who overcomes is the one that believes in Jesus Christ. He will grant him to sit with him in his throne. You know, an interesting point is he's not on his throne. He's on his father's throne. But he's not on not yet sitting on his throne. Here is a clear indication that the overcomers, the believers in this church and in and in the rest of the other six churches are going to sit with him in his throne. That's how close, folks, that we are to Christ. We are in Christ. Did you know that in Christ was Paul's one of Paul's most favorite phrases? In Christ. And so we'll have to conclu conclude the, this teaching here. Verse 22, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Folks, position is one thing. Condition, quite another. If, uh, if the difference between Christ dying for us and our dying with Him are being crucified with Christ, if it hasn't been acknowledged and applied, you can be assured that, that the self, your self-life, is still the dominating factor in your life. You're going to talk about self. You're going to talk about, oh, how you did this and did that and uh, all the, you know, the other thing. You know, it's funny. I, I never run into Christians like that that... Uh, that, that come up to me and say, you know, I, well, you know, there's this really odd bunch of other Christians out there that they're not talking about what they've done. They're not talking about how that they did this or that or the other thing. All they want to talk about is Jesus Christ. <laughs> not once have I ever, ever saw that. And that's kind of odd. 
because I'm sure that they have encountered those like that. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, folks, which life do we consecrate to God? Which life? Our old or our new? God can't accept anything from the old. He sees and, and He acknowledges only that which is centered in His Son who is our life. We're told to yield ourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. Okay? We walk on resurrection ground. This is our only ground. It's, it's our only position. And it's from this position we're to count ourselves dead to sin, self, the law, the world, and alive to God in the risen Christ to walk in newness of life, His life. That's the message we are to hold forth. Don't judge or determine your position by your condition. I love you all. I truly do. Thank you for everything for all your messages of prayers, for my recent injury, my healing. I'm feeling better. I've still got a ways to go, but I just want to thank you for all your comments, all of your support. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.